Welcome back, party people. Mike here with The Social Life of Language, and today we are covering an article by Jennifer Delfino titled, White Allies and the Semiotics of Wokeness, Ratiolinguistic Chronotopes of White Virtue on Facebook. Now, I know a lot of folks out there have some really weird feelings about this idea of wokeness. Today, I'm gonna ask that we press pause on all of those weird feelings, take a deep breath, because what we're doing today is critique, which is different from criticism. Criticism is pretty much just bashing the idea of wokeness, which can be fun to do sometimes, but that's not what we're doing today. Today we are critiquing wokeness. That means we want to understand what is happening and why it's happening. So with that said, let's find out. Now, before anything, we gotta be able to identify two major forms of racism. For a long time now, race theorists have been saying that we need to focus on something called systemic racism or institutional racism, which is a different conversation than talking about individual racists or individuals doing racist things. But also at the same time, a lot of us are like, yeah, we need to focus on systemic racism, but also what, what is that? Can somebody just tell me what it is and I'll do it. I'll fix it. So for real, what is this thing called systemic racism? What makes up the racism that lives in the system or in the institution? Well, to understand that, we kind of got to understand how we imagine the individual racist. As an example, let's think about law enforcement, but at the level of the individual person. Often we watch the news that identifies the figure of the bad racist cop. The problem appears to be that there are bad apples ruining the bunch. So you don't think this is a systemic problem, it's just, quote, a few bad apples? Uh, I think it is definitely a few bad apples, but I think that most police officers are really good folks. Some African-American community leaders and a lot of others actually have said it's systemic. I don't what believe do you... that. No, I don't believe that. I think the police do an incredible job. And I think you do have some bad apples. I think you'd agree every once in a while you'll see something. And now, okay, the word figure is a technical term used a lot in the article. But for this video, we're going to use the word character, as in a stock character of a movie or a book. These stock characters are kind of based on a whole bunch of stereotypical behaviors. We can almost predict what they're going to do in the movie or the book. So in that sense, we can almost create an entire world around these stock characters because we expect certain things from certain characters. Now we know that stereotypical human beings do not exist, but we talk as if they exist. We talk as if they behave like certain kinds of characters. In reality, a big part of the way we think uses these kinds of characters as a way that we might categorize certain groups of people or even how we might perceive certain individuals we meet in real life. So when we think of people as characters, this is a way that certain people become associated with certain kinds of stereotypical behaviors. So for example, some racial stock characters might include people like rednecks or maybe a gang member. We tend to imagine these characters a certain way and then we also tend to imagine these characters as being from a certain race group. Now, things like mainstream news networks also use these kinds of stock characters to tell stories or to report the news because it helps to make sense out of certain situations. For example, when it comes to police murders, the news media tends to focus on the characterological persona that we call the bad racist cop or the bad apple that spoils the bunch of good apples. So logically from this point, we start looking for examples of good apples or we start trying to defend individual good police officers. And you start hearing people say stuff like, not all cops are the same, or the overwhelming majority of police officers are good. The overwhelming majority of police officers are good and honest and fair and care deeply about their communities. Most cops are, are, are good, but the fact is the bad ones have to be identified and prosecuted and out. 
Eric Adams thinks the overwhelming number of police officers are committed to doing their job, but he says the rotten apples are bringing the department down. Essentially, we try to remind people that the good cop also exists too. Now remember, these characters are really just idealized forms of people. Now I'm not saying that good people don't exist in law enforcement, but that is a different conversation for a different day. Here, we are focusing on why the good cop versus bad cop conversation keeps coming up over and over. And also, what other kinds of conversations get shut down when we become fixated on finding individual good cops or individual bad cops? Because at this point, that is all we are talking about. The article we are covering today calls this the individualist approach to racism. Because literally we are focusing on individuals. On individual racists or individual non-racists. And the problem is that the conversation really just gets that far and then it stops. The idea of systemic racism or institutional or structural racism is basically nowhere in sight. It's completely gone from the conversation. Okay, so for simplicity's sake, let's just stick to the word systemic racism. A systemic approach to racism might say, let's not focus on the character of the good cop or the bad cop or the individual bad apples. Because the serious problem is actually that the apple tree itself is completely rotten. The system itself is rotten. So let's think of an example of the system at work. Think of one of those very slow police murders that we've seen on TV recently. Without fail, the news media immediately focuses on the bad cop himself. We start thinking about why or why not he acted in this certain way. What did he intend to do? Then we also have reporters uncovering his police history. The New York Times points out that Chauvin's conduct before George Floyd led to at least 22 complaints or internal investigations. And tonight we've learned the officer has faced dozens of complaints of excessive force. And Fort Lauderdale police tell us since starting with the department in 2015, Officer Paul has been involved in 74 use of force incidents. And then sometimes we have reporters going into their Facebook accounts and they search for evidence of a racist person. That is just the way things tend to go on TV. But for the moment, let's think about the apple tree itself. Let's think about the 10 cops that were surrounding the incident and literally just watching the murder happen. Let me say this very clearly. It does not matter whether or not those cops were good cops or bad cops. Their individual intentions do not matter. All of that is irrelevant because of their law enforcement training that choking a person to death was the right way to handle the situation. So in the United States, you can murder someone and have it basically live streamed on the internet and the law enforcement system offers immunity from prosecution 99% of the time to all of these police officers. The apple tree protects the bad apples. But also let's zoom out a little bit further. Let's take a further step back because we have another rotten apple tree standing right next to the law enforcement apple tree. We have something called the court system. The court system legally condones and protects this kind of killing. These are the systems of systemic racism. How are these apple trees allowed to grow in the first place? Well, because they are planted in very rotten soil. We might even call this the soil of white supremacy. But unfortunately, it's just so much easier to talk about the individual bad apples. However, the minute you pluck out one bad apple, a brand new one sprouts right back in. Much of what we see on the news and on social media, I'm talking about the very popular stuff, the stuff that is not that deep, whether it's right wing or left wing, much of the time it's concerned about plucking out the bad apples. What we have called the individualist approach to solving racism. The individualist approach believes that calling out people is the most efficient way of eventually solving the problem of racism. And unfortunately, American society has become 
deeply invested in the individualist approach. It's hard to get out of that conversation. So part of what Delfino's article is trying to uncover is why talking about bad apples is so important to people, specifically to people who might consider themselves allies. Indeed, the author asserts that the individualist approach is an important and meaningful way that some white people create their own identity as white people. This is a kind of white racial distinction or distinctions within the white identity. One such way people think about their identity is imagining different kinds of white people, different kinds of white characters. And remember, these white stock characters are really idealized, stereotypical images of people. And when these characters come up in conversation, that becomes a chance for a white person to say, oh, that's not me. So what kind of characters might a white anti-racist person point to and say, I'm nothing like that. Well, how about the character of the redneck? But what's wrong with the character called the redneck? Well, not only can rednecks be positioned as probably racist from a racist South, it's also easy to position them as dumb or uneducated or anti-intellectual. Now in that description, notice how we just attached a place from where they're from. We talked about their intelligence and maybe that they hate thinking in general. So when we use these racial stock characters, we're also attaching this huge amount of information to them. We attach all of these stereotypical beliefs about them. We might also say that all of that together is the opposite of a woke ally, a woke white person, because the character of the woke ally is believed to be smart, rational, educated, self-educated about racism, and typically of this higher consciousness, a higher mode of awareness, everything that a redneck is not. So part of making yourself a distinct kind of white person involves separating yourself from certain kinds of other white persons. For example, if you are constantly bashing bad, uneducated rednecks, you are implying indirectly that you are not a redneck. You are actually a good and educated and anti-racist white person. And when you imply things about yourself, you are creating your own identity. That's fine. Everyone does it. But we got to think about what conversation has taken over when a good white person starts calling out a bad white person or starts calling out bad characters like rednecks. Because doesn't the calling out of individual bad rednecks sound very much like the method we were using when we were calling out individual bad racist cops. It's that very similar line of thinking. We again become trapped in this conversation about calling out individual bad apples. Again, we get sucked into the individualist approach to solving racism, an approach that hyper-focuses on individual racists instead of systemic racism or institutional racism or structural racism. All of that just disappears in the background. Now let's think a little bit more about the process of separating bad white characters and good white characters, or good figures versus bad figures. In this article, the fancy terminology for this is figure of personhood, or what I've just been calling characters. A major aspect of this theory of characters is remembering that characters are imagined people who are from a specific time and a specific place. A when and a where. The technical term for this when where is actually in the title of the article. It's called a chronotope. Translation is pretty straightforward. Chrono means time. Tope means space. Chronotope means time space. But for this video, we're going to replace the word chronotope and just use the phrase when where because it's easier. There's a lot of big ass words in here. Jeez. This means that moving forward in the video, every time we talk about a character in our heads, we also got to think about the when and the where they are from. Let's do a couple super easy when wheres for a couple of really obvious racial stock characters. An easy one would be 
a KKK member. Okay, so we imagine that they live in the South. That's the where. But notice, in real life, KKK members really actually live anywhere they want. They don't just live in the South. But the KKK character, the figure of personhood, we imagine is probably from the South. That's the where. Now, we often imagine KKK members paired with Confederate flags, which, yes, also signals the South, but we also might imagine that as part of history, as part of the past. That is the when, the past. Now, again, there are KKK members alive and well today. But as characters, we tend to imagine them as of the past and of the South. So that is the when, where of that stock racial character. Okay, I think one more example and we'll really get it. How about the uneducated racist redneck? Again, the where might be the South. We might also think of the Confederate flag, which again, we might think the past, but also stock characters are imagined to do things. So along with the when and the where, there is also the question of what do they do or what social practices do we imagine them engaging in? We don't really imagine rednecks sitting in a Harvard classroom or going snowboarding down a mountain. That just doesn't make sense with the character. We might think of rednecks as sitting on a couch or sitting on the porch with a shotgun. We might think of them clinging to their old racist ways. Again, we are positioning the redneck character as embodying the past. Or in the fancy terminology, this makes up the chronotope of the figure of personhood recognized as a redneck. So while you read the article, every time you see that big ass word chronotope, all we're really talking about is the when and the where. And every time you see the phrase figure of personhood, we are thinking about recognizable characters that live in that when and where. Now, a big part of what our author Delfino is analyzing is the when, where of a more recent character, the white ally. Very quickly, let's think of the chronotope, the when, where for the white ally. The where might be the protest. Think of all the news footage and all the Instagram pictures of white allies at a protest. What about the when? When does this happen? Well, the when might be today, the present, the current political era, the right now. And what does this character of the white ally do? At an obvious level, the white ally is in the protests in public, but also the white ally tends to call out other bad white people. And the reason they do that is because perhaps they feel ethically obligated to do it because they are practicing anti-racism. They are educating themselves and becoming conscious of their whiteness. And they're seeing other white people that also need to maybe do some work on themselves. Let's look at an example from Delfino's article. All right, so here we got everything. Let's start with the where. It's the protest, the when, the present. Also part of the present is the political era when the Black Lives Matter movement was at its peak. And what is the person in the photo doing? Well, let's look at what his sign says because he's telling you what he's doing. It says, I'm sorry I'm late. I had a lot to learn. So what is he doing? He has just announced that he arrived and that he's still learning or he's self-educating. He also apologizes for being late when he says, I'm sorry I'm late. But we could also interpret this as the acknowledgement that at one time in the recent past, he was stuck in his old ways. He was stuck in the beliefs of the past, but now he has arrived in the present and ready to take on racism from today on into the future. All of this put together helps create what we imagine to be a white ally character. As Delfino says, the figure of the ally is constructed as embodying a sort of racial exceptionalism that is achieved through critical, rational consciousness. Let's look at another photo from Delfino's article. It says, as a white man, I can never walk a mile in a black man's shoes, but I can lace mine up, walk beside him, and say, I stand with you. So again, notice he is presenting himself as critically conscious, educated and aware of racism. He refers to himself as a white man. All of that is white identity construction. He claims that from now on, he will walk besides black men. He is lacing up his boots, 
and getting ready to take that journey into the future right next to black men. That is his personal path to wokeness. So here we have all the things. We have the when, where, and the what he's gonna do about it, crucially. We also gotta notice that these signs embed moral stances. A moral display of doing the right thing. Doing the brave and virtuous thing. And when we see people publicly displaying virtues, we call that virtue signaling. And Delfino says this helps construct white virtue as integral to white allyship. All right, so now let's start thinking about how the good white ally character also helps to indirectly create opposite kinds of bad white characters. The good white character and the bad white character appear to be going down totally different paths. The good path to progress versus the bad path to regression. The good path to a good America without racism versus the bad path, the backward path, as in going backward in time toward a more racist America. Now here's the thing. What we got again is a conversation about good individuals versus bad individuals. Critiques of systemic racism are nowhere to be found in these conversations. The conversation becomes about how white people, through becoming educated, through becoming self-aware, will be the ones to eventually end and solve racism. Or to phrase that differently, white people have the power to make America not racist. It's white people's responsibility to save America. It elevates the approaches of white allies as the solution to racism. Even though much of white ally discourse is pretty much about calling people out or educating individual white people to not be racist anymore. All of this constitutes the individualist approach to racism. This is a major problem. Aside from being a purely individualist approach to racism that probably doesn't work, it also propagates the belief that dialogue and education will solve racism. That we can just think and talk our way out of racial problems. All we gotta do is sit down and use our rationality. This has never worked. But notice how white allyship discourses loves dropping references to MLK and the peaceful civil rights movements. The civil rights movement was not peaceful. Fact. MLK was arrested. Fact. MLK was assassinated. Fact. The civil rights movement was not peaceful. Fact. But again, according to much white ally discourse, we're supposed to be able to talk and think our way out of these problems. Which is why whenever violence breaks out, many white allies are quick to say they are completely against violence. Or they'll say things like, violence is never the answer. What this kind of condemning of racialized violence ultimately leads to is the delegitimizing of certain forms of direct action. Anything beyond dialogue and talking is perceived as just too much and going too far. So in news media accounts, direct action is very quickly framed as riots or race riots. These are not acts of peaceful protest, but really domestic terror. My administration coordinated with the state and local authorities to deploy the National Guard, surge federal law enforcement, to Kenosha and stop the violence. In other words, the only legitimate path forward to racial progress is to talk it out. That proposition centers white allyship as the only form of activism that will achieve racial progress. What Delfino found in her research within these white ally Facebook groups was that there's this tendency to elevate white liberal perspectives and political strategies. And this elevation worked at the expense of non-white perspectives and non-white political strategies. In my opinion, if you're constantly elevating white ways of doing things, or the white worldview that centers whiteness as the superior path forward into the future, doesn't that kind of sound like a form of white supremacy? Now, is that the intention of these white allies? No, of course not. That's the opposite of their intentions. But what makes white supremacy so lethal is that it goes 
deep into our structures, our institutions, and our systems. It goes so deep that it doesn't need individual person's intentions to thrive. But if all we're doing is screaming about racism at the individual level, or screaming about these bad individual people, or screaming about how this woke person over here isn't woke enough, then really we just don't have any space left to talk about systemic racism. And that is a major problem. And lastly, if you're super interested in this topic about white characters or white allies, there's a YouTube theorist named FD Signifier who released a video called How Not to Be an Ally. And in that video, he goes over three white ally media archetypes that come out in movies and TV shows. I've come up with three set archetypal categories of what allies tend to look like in the media. These are the homie, the partner, and the savior. Fascinating stuff. Well, that's all for today, folks. Once again, I'm Mike Mena with The Social Life of Language. You can download all of my articles from maestromikemena.com. And we're done.